Okay, so we are here today for episode three of uh, my Brothers in Rhythm podcast. It's myself and my lovely wife, Sasha, here today. Ellen. Um, and, and for people that haven't seen the first two episodes, we are here um, talking about the circumstances uh, of what happened around my brother's tragic and untimely passing uh, just in October 2020. We're only two and a half years down the line. Um, but in episodes one and two, we talk about what happened in the run-up to his passing. And today we take off from where we left off. We do indeed. And I would like to start this podcast by, um, I know, and funnily enough, this morning we were watching the Rise show. Um, and one of the topics that Lucinda, the therapist, was talking about was talking about death. Now, we all know, in right here, right now, well, we're 21st of April, 2023, that is today, and uh, a shocking amount of people have died suddenly. Died su when anybody dies suddenly in any way, it is always the most shocking thing that can happen to anybody that was close to that person or had a relationship with that person in any way. Um, and it is, it's only, it's only when it's happened to you that you know, because there's all kinds of different ways that people die. The only thing that we have in this world that is absolute is that we are all going to die. And that is not something that we should be scared of because it is what's going to happen to all of us. Path, of course. If you spend your life being scared of death, then, then the, for me, it is a life spent in fear. Not fully lived. And it's not fully lived. And so when somebody passes from this plane, this dimension that we're on, and what anybody's um, feelings, religions, spiritual beliefs, whatever they may be, is different for so many people. Um, but what we do know, what we 100% know, is that on that, on that passing, that we lose their physical form. And before losing your brother, uh, I had only really experienced losing my grandparents and it was only and you know I loved my <laughs> my grandparents well and there we have it again so I had different relationships with my grandparents mm -hmm. um, my grandmother on my dad's side not so close or, no on my dad's side my no dad's on my side, dad's close, side yeah. I was and we were very close and um, my grandmother on my mother's side wasn't the same kind of lady let's just leave that one there so we all experience different passings. We lose pets, we lose, you know, that's normally the first thing that all of us, if we have pets in our life, these are the first passings that we deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want this to be a morbid, um, difficult podcast for everybody to, to have to uh, live, go through with this. And, and that's something that I would like to say from, we are six months on from those first two podcasts that you did. We are, yeah. <clears throat> um, the feedback, what, what? It's, yeah, it's been amazing. Um, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of support and encouragement, which has been amazing for me. It's really helped me on my healing journey. Um, for me to be able to release that truth and, and, and that pain um, there was a lot of crying in those podcasts, but we've done the crying. We're not going to be uh, hopefully crying too much today. I can't guarantee that. Can't guarantee. Can never guarantee <laughs> can't it. Guarantee you can never guarantee it. it. <laughs> uh, we, there will be a tear or two, um, but yeah, we're we're more here to drill down and focus on the catalogue of failings of the services um, that let my brother down um, in the build up to his death, but again, in the wake of his death and also let us down massively. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this is it, you know, on, on that day, and we left that last podcast and we going 
touching on that feedback that we've had, it's not had thousands and thousands and thousands of views, but it's had hundreds. And some of those hundreds of people have uh, come back to us and everybody has, that's, that's the first thing everybody said, emotional. And my God, has it been an emotional journey. Mm. How do you deal with those emotions? Hmm. That's been that's the first learning lesson, isn't it? You know, how how do we deal with those emotions and and carry on with our lives, keep it together, all of those things. Now, it 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 has always been emotional. It will always be emotional. Life is emotional. Um, death is emotional. Um, emotions. Our, a part of life. Our spirit. That is, without our emotions, what are we? Dead from the eyebrows down. Um, without being able to let go of our emotions and not being able to release those emotions is the most damaging thing, I believe, for all of us as human beings. Mm -hmm. and for our physical and mental health. We are, we cry for a reason. Mm. We were made to cry when things are sad or when things are happy or when things just take over us with emotion then we, we are not ashamed and we should never none of us should ever be ashamed to let those emotions go or um, for feeling the way that you feel yeah and I have been in my life I have held back so many tears but I have cried an ocean an actual ocean <laughs> since your brother died um, and since everything that has happened since that day, it's been emotional. <laughs> Seeing you cry. <laughs> I've felt every single emotion. It's not just crying, it's not just sadness. I've been the most disappointed I've ever been in my life. I've been the saddest I've ever been in my life. I've been the most angry I've ever been in my life. And I've had to really learn how to control that. I'm not, I'm not an angry person, I'm not a violent person, I never have been, I'm a lover, not a fighter, I'm a musician, I'm not a sportsman, I'm not like that, way wired. You're um, a lover, not a fighter. Yeah, um, but... Oh, when you lose someone that you love so much. And then people want to use your love against you and make you feel guilt over their passing, make you feel bad, smear you, make others think badly of you. And it, make up all kinds <coughs> of things. And tell a lot of lies. And, and that, you know... Um, which we will get into the extent of, but... We will, it, and, you know, all, all will be revealed. And we left the last podcast on, on the 30th of October 2020 when we got that knock on the door. And that fateful knock on the door is... I mean, it's not being dramatic. You don't need to be dramatic when, it, when it's real, real, real life. And when you get that knock on the door, and that shock, well, that shock, you're just in shock. And, Pure shock. And you can't describe what shock is like, because it's just... It's not like anything you've ever felt before. I mean, I lost my father when I was young, and I was only 17 then, and that was a shock. I wasn't expecting him to pass away. And uh, that's the only thing close to this shock. But this shock, again, was different. And this is what it was even It was even more unexpected. And this is what everybody that's dealing <clears throat> with a died suddenly event, with anybody they know is having to deal with. Mm. The shock, the shock waves, the shock that happens to you bodily, physically, mentally, spiritually, to your soul, everything, because you feel the wrench from that physical person. And you know that that's never, that physical, that hug, that, 
they're the conversation. The conversation. And you, you know, and that, and that's that's the that's the uh, physical. <clears throat> that's what we. That's what passing. That's what loss is. It's yeah. That, it is that physical thing, and and it is always a shock. So on that day, and this for me, I'm talking about the emotions. Is for me. I didn't have the relationship. <laughs> it's your brother. So for me, I am one hundred percent. All I'm worried about is you. <laughs> at this point, you know, and and knowing that he's in shock, knowing that you're you're you just don't know what the hell is going going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, we we come home that day. I mean, probably what is it, five o'clock, five thirty, or something like that. By the time we get home, yeah. Um, just to bring it back into time scales set the here. Same. Yeah, so we the, we got the knock on the door at three o'clock. And my first question, because I hadn't seen my brother for four months up until this point, and I'd, I'd only been in telephone contact really with my mother for the last four months, was, and he was living with her at this time, her address. Um, and so my f first question to the police officer was, is she okay? Um, have you checked in on my mother? And to which he said no. Um, he then explained to me the circumstances of how he was found a little bit. Um, but then uh, a short while after I asked him to accompany us to my mother's house um, to go and deliver the news to her because I hadn't seen her for a while and I was not sure how she was going to react. <coughs> um, so I drove you, I drove you there and this is where we left the last podcast. Yeah. The policeman went in, your sister went in, we were sitting outside and the policeman came outside, said that he'd been asked to tell us to go and that your mother would call in a couple of days. That she would that call, call me. call did not come. Yeah, nobody from the family phoned me. Um, we, get, so we, we get come home. We come home, we're in shock from just, we're just that. We're just sitting <laughs> I, I, here, so we're sitting right here. We're yeah. in shock. <coughs> um, um, <coughs> my mother, at this point, hadn't said to me that I'd fallen out with her or anything, that I'd done anything wrong. She was just telling me I couldn't come to the house when Tim was there. And couldn't talk about him. And we, I wasn't allowed to talk about him. Okay. Um, the last time I spoke to her, she, she, was, she was saying it was because of Tim was getting angry if I came to the house. And that then changed to because it was because of the family. And that was in June. And we stopped. We, we had to stay away. Um, so at this point, when, my, when I'm told that my brother's passed away, I've not been able to speak to him for four months and then suddenly he's gone. All and you wanted to do was talk to him. But then we're, we're, you know, we're, we're now at home at five o'clock and nobody's telling me anything. No one reaches out to talk to me from the family. The police don't contact us. Okay. The next thing that happens is nine o'clock. Nine o'clock that evening. There's a post on Facebook by my brother Mark. Now, just to put it in perspective, he's my oldest brother and had not really been around the family in the home in the last 30 years. Not, no, not nowhere near on the same relationship as me and Tim. Um, we did used to see him and his kids, but hardly at all. Actually, only up until about a year before, me and Tim had never been to his house before, until we went there for one Christmas. Um, and he announced on Facebook that he said it was with a sad heart he had to uh, inform everybody uh, that Tim lost his battle with bipolar today, taking his own life. This is, now, this is four a hours. Post. This, this is, this a public post Facebook is, post. This is a public four Facebook hours post. after he's found on the beach, that nobody has any information. No other family have been told anything, and he's posting publicly about it. My Facebook and my phone messages go off. So at this point, my. Literally, Mike's Facebook messages, his WhatsApp, his phone starts going, and everybody is contacting him, going, what is going on, what has happened? And Mike can't tell them anything. All he can tell them at this stage is the police don't know anything. Um, all I can tell them is that he was found in the, in the sea. That's it, that that's all I know and that he at this point. He doesn't know how he was because he hadn't been able to see him. As you can imagine, he was in serious, serious distress. As everybody, as all friends would be, 
you know, everybody was there for him, and we said we would contact, Mike said he would contact anybody as soon as he knows anything. So this is on a Friday. Um, the next thing that happens is that my nephew also posts a similar post on Facebook just an hour after Mark. Um, and actually, so this is how it rolled on the day. What we didn't know at the time was actually the first thing that was done by a family member was by Brian Parsons, who phoned a guy called Andy Ramos and informed him that Tim had killed himself. This was at eight o'clock, before anyone had posted on social media, before any family member had been told, before anything else. And this is listed in a public blog by... By Andy. Andy Ramos, so it's nothing that isn't in the public sphere, it is in the public blog. Um, Ev just to, to say that, everything that we speak about today is, is on facts that we have. There, there, are, there is no slander here, it's completely factual, truthful. We will only speak the truth and what we know. The whole truth and nothing And from us. the evidence that we have. Um, Do you have a little... Can we, yeah, can we just have a breather? Because it's really intense. Yeah, it is. I'm sh I was shaking. I'm fucking shaking. <sighs> so I just had to take a minute there before I was overcome with uh, a trigger trauma for the shock and everything that we went on that day. Oh, yeah. Um, everything that happened that day shouldn't have happened that day, obviously. However, <clears throat> what then happened... Obviously, I'm looking after my husband, who's in shock. Um, and trying to contact the coroner. Um, now, this was actually headline news. in, So we obviously knew because the Argus and Shoreham Herald uh, were on the beach and reported... They reported that reported day. ...reported what was happening. Um, and there was press on that beach. Obviously, after... Um, but it wasn't that we didn't know. So there was, it had not been put out that the body on the beach in the Argus, it obviously wasn't naming who that person was. Um, but obviously we knew. Nobody else knew at that stage. Who My that mother person. knew. Yeah, but who knew? Yeah, and your mother knew that that person, because we were obviously... PC Dangal. PC Dangal. Obviously, your mother. Um, that the the body that was on the beach was obviously his brother. However, that wasn't put out into the public sphere at this point. So I'm looking after you, and we, I'm trying to get a hold of the coroner. Um, and then we're we'll waiting for the police or my family member to call us. Wait, hoping somebody's going to reach out to Mike. They said they would in a few days. They said so. We gave it three days. So we gave it three days, and then I called one o one. Um, we're still in the absolute dark, not knowing what the hell's going on. Trying to speak to the coroner. The coroner's saying, I think the coroner just said he was going to call us and to contact him by email, something along those lines. Yeah. We have all of these calls recorded. We record everything for quality, transparency and uh, protection at all times now. <clears throat> and so I called 101 and I got through to 101. So 101 for anybody globally watching, that is the emergency services, non-emergency number. So if you've got emergency, it's 999 over here. And if it's anything a, else reporting anything else wise, 101. so 101, I was on the phone too. I managed to get through to somebody. Uh, I had been given some kind of information that a PC Rowley was dealing with the case from the coroner's office, and so I spoke to somebody there, uh, said that PC Rowley, I believed, was dealing with the case, and they said, Make a complaint. There's no, yeah, they said there's no information they could give, share with us at this point um, and to make a complaint. To make a complaint. So I'm phoning up saying... We've been delivered... My husband's brother has been found on the beach. This has all happened. We've not heard anything from anybody. We're Since being delivered the, the death dark. message. We've been given the death message, then told to go and know nothing. And they tell me to make a complaint. <coughs> which I duly did, and I do have that complaint. 
I'm not. I, can I read it out? Yeah, it's alright, we can pause and you can grab that. Sorry. I didn't know anything about dealing with the police before all of this happened. And it's not in this one, it's in the other one. Anyway. I made a um, complaint on the um, email thing that they gave me. So they gave me an email, they said make a complaint. I made a complaint. And in that complaint, it says that I am extremely concerned that everything that's happened over the last six months um, has been a set, set up in some way and that this death is suspicious. And I'm already saying this because everything that's been happening is getting more and more suspicious. Unnatural. I am, I am an incredibly intuitive person, more intuitive than I ever realised I was before. And to say that it was suspicious and that it was red flags and bells ringing in our ears all the way through. Now, when we were originally given the death message, to begin with, and I have to put this out and say this, I, I thought, like many other people would go, oh, has he killed himself? Hmm. And it would be the natural, shall we say, assumption. It would be the natural assumption. Conclusion. The conclusion, the natural assumption. And we have never, ever, ever thought that that couldn't have been... A possibility. A possibility. Hmm. And at that time... We knew it was a possibility, and we said it was a possibility at all times. But we were also saying that there was some really, really dodgy stuff. Some really, really shady, bad, unnatural behaviour going on that needed to be looked at. And why the hell had this actually happened? Because as far as we were concerned, he was supposed to be getting better. And that's the only reason that you weren't... Any, concerned. You weren't more concerned than you were. No. Because the small amount of information that you had been given. I'd been told that he was happier he being back there. The that he was better, that he was getting better, and we were hoping. However, you had been told that, but your instinct, your natural reaction, and all of the things that were actually happening in real fucking life were leading you to think, no, my, my brother's not better. Because if my brother's better, why has he never texted me? Mm. Why has he never phoned me? Why has he never spoken Why to does me? he not want to talk to me? What's why the big deal here? Talk to me? We hadn't fallen out and had any argument whatsoever. And this is one of the big lies told by the family to police, to doctors, to the mental health services. But this is just one of many lies. Many. <clears throat> So, we know nothing about what the police are supposed to be doing, nothing about coroners, nothing about that. Who does? Unless you've been in this situation, unless you've been in a died suddenly situation. Or watched loads of police dramas or something, maybe. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't watch a load of those things, but, yeah. And police dramas, what happens on those doesn't always happen in real life. <sighs> yeah, but you might have an idea of who, what a coroner's thing. I had no idea. No, none of that. I had no and idea. And I had no idea. And I had no idea. And I, I, and I extend this invitation to anybody that is dealing with coroners, um, anything that died suddenly, anything that they're dealing with, with this kind of thing, please reach out to us. Yeah. Because everything that we've learned in the last few years, if we can help anybody else that is dealing with coroners <sighs> and the services and those things, if we can shed any light of the kind of things that we've learned that we've had to do, to f actually try to get any kind of understanding, knowledge or information about what happened and why you've lost your brother and why this happened. And even if it was suicide, why was that? To this day, the family situation? and the police cannot give us any actual explanation to how he ended up in the water. It is, it is said that he walked to the end of the road. This is by the family, this is their statement that they wanted to put forward. No, can we put this specific? We should, must be specific. So we're going to try to sum up the most uh, prevalent occurrences that happened from that day yeah. up until the inquest. 
Because what happens when there is a death by unnatural circumstances and a suicide and all of these things... There's a certain are, procedure that should be all, followed. There is a certain procedure in the UK that needs to be... And I can only talk for the UK because that's the only one I have experience with. There is a certain procedure that has to be followed. Sussex and Surrey police have a specific sudden death procedure that they <coughs> must follow. We had no idea at this point. That, a line that, of duty, that, these kind of things. So the coroner's services, the medical services, all of these... Who's happen. notified in what order, what's allowed to happen by when, post-mortem. Post-mortems, and then if the death, in pretty much all died suddenly cases, if it cannot be categorically stated as to why this person has died at this at the medical, mm. uh, medical side, mm. then this will, should always go to inquest. I know there are a lot of people, and I know a lot of deaths aren't going to inquest, that mm. maybe should be. Should be, yeah. What I do know is that as this happened uh, on the 30th of October 2020, which is only six months after lockdown, the virtual side of our world became very, very difficult. And you know, the virtual side of our world took over the physical side of our world. And so, and whereas coroner's courts and all of these things were normally public, all of these courts now suddenly were not. Mm. Um, and there were people weren't being actually seen in the same way. So normally people will be seen, people will be going to offices, going to... The public are allowed to attend, it's and, all... But yeah, and also, but you know, seeing police it's officers. It's a public inquest, yeah. But also seeing police officers, seeing social services. Family liaison officer. People know that normally these circumstances were happening in physical presence, mm. but in all of this kind of time around lockdown, everything went virtual, and so we're all actually nobody seeing people Things have been done by email, and yeah. when police are, should have been actually sitting with, with people. people and taking statements, they're not. They're getting them to write them out and, and email them over. An email. So they're not actually ever physically seeing people, and this is where I believe an awful lot of problems have happened across lockdown. Mm -hmm. It's not just us. We're yeah. not the only people no. that have dealt with tragedies. No and all kinds of nightmare scenarios of people not getting help and the system being broken and then it being even more broken yeah. because nobody's being seen. The communication is being even more broken than it was before. It was already bad. Yeah. It, then it just got a hell of a lot worse. For anybody dealing with any mental health services, they all would have been thrown into complete and utter chaos. Complete and utter chaos and overloaded so lockdown happens domestic abuse calls go off the chart yeah police 999 calls go off the chart mm -hmm. everything's exploding and basically the system is already broken mm. so then it's just breaking more and all of the cracks are appearing mm -hmm. and this is an awful lot of what it's there's failings upon failings upon failings and suspicion upon suspicion upon suspicion but what you've got is always catalogues of errors, catalogues of people not wanting to own up where they've made mistakes or they haven't, you know, they haven't done things properly or the, the box wasn't ticked in the correct way. And when you've got that, and then they kind of steamroll and there's more and more and more of them. So it's just like a ball of people covering up. And that's where things can get really, 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 really difficult for everybody. Um, and so, and so, this is what happens, isn't it? So, as what happens when um, somebody dies suddenly is that anybody. So, first of all, the next of kin is contacted, and this is what we know now. We didn't know at the time. The next of kin is contacted, and then they should be dealing with the coroner. Now, the next of kin in this circumstance is a very, very elderly old lady mentally unwell old lady so we now know that the authority was given to your eldest brother to be dealing with everything with the coroner with the, with the police mm -hmm. and as Mike has already explained this relationship wasn't anything like 
the relationship you you two had and it was very very broken and have been for a long time there was no shall we call it relationship, relationship. There, was, there was no brotherly love there then there was no even you know community there was very little communication the commun yeah, yeah. in any way so things have fallen down very badly at this point for the services because they should have been investing on understanding who it was the closest, the closest relationship. personal relative of same body and mind of this person is. Mm. And for me, that's where they're first failing, where people have not invested the time <clears throat> this... to actually speak to Mike. Yeah, this was the police's first excuse for not speaking to me, not taking a statement. They just said that they were dealing with the next of kin, passing all information to her and that she did not want them to disclose any of that information to me. So immediately you know that it's shut down. This was one of the first massive alarm bells. I'm like, why? What the actual fuck? Why does nobody want to tell me what's happened? Why does nobody want to tell me the last time they saw him alive? No, why does nobody want to tell me what happened in the run-up? We didn't find out any of that information until we got a statement, what she said to the police. They didn't want to tell me a thing. I'm trying to ring, trying to find out. Been... <sighs> they were so cold. Um, we waited for them to call us and uh, waited three days and then I phoned my mother. And I said, hello, mum. And she said, are you all right? And I said, well, no, obviously not. And I know you're not. And, uh, I just phoned in to find out what's going on. And she says that she blames me. I blame you and Sasha. And I'm like, what, what, what do you mean, mum, you blame me? She says, I haven't, well, to tell you the truth, Michael, I haven't got a good word to say about you. This is the first time I'm speaking to my mum after losing my brother. I'm just like, what? What are you going on about? And then she says that she doesn't want to talk to me and she puts phone down. <clears throat> Shocking. So this is all happening around the same time as us trying to get in contact with the police, trying to get in contact with the coroner. You reached out to the, um, straight out to our MP, didn't you, when the police weren't helping us? So at the same time as I was going to 101, I was like, I, I contacted the MP. So first of all, I contacted Tim Loughton's office MP, um, who is the, and still is, and has been for many years, I believe, the MP for Lansing, and Worthing, Shoreham, and um, East Worth Worthing. Yeah, it? that's right, yeah. Now, he's not actually our MP, but he is um, the, the constituency where all of this has, has occurred, happened. where everything's occurred, we, and where the services are based. And yeah, we actually live uh, half an hour north of there, um, and our MP is Andrew Griffith. 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 And Andrew and Tim Loughton's office were the most compassionate out of anybody I've dealt with. Yeah. Uh, they were the most helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew had an immediate surgery booked with us, and we had that on. It was. Um, it was quick. They got 27th it booked in quick. Twenty seventh of November. Yeah, we had a telephone uh, conversation with um, a sex. Was it Kieran? Yeah. Before that, and uh, and she she was super compassionate. She arranged the surgery for us. We had a surgery with Andrew Griffith. Who, that was he... at the end of November. A lot happened before that. Yeah. Between. <coughs> so between that one phone call, and then you were uh, you tried to call again. Again to find out what was going on, what was going to be fine. What and what your was brother what was answered. they're still not telling me anything that's happened. My brother Mark answered the phone and I said, well, look, if she won't tell me what's happened, I said, when's the last time you saw him? And he said, it's not relevant. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Uh, I, I, there were so many times when I was almost speechless on the phone to what I was hearing. 
um, and uh, they were all round there going through my brother's stuff. You then got a letter from the mediation that had yeah. been um, instructed by PC Sean Treble. Um, and that mediation said, sorry to hear that he killed himself. <coughs> so, we're, so we're sorry to hear that y your brother Mark has been in touch with us to inform us that your brother Timothy took his own life. Now, at this stage, to make it really, really clear, we are in contact with the coroner's office. We are in contact with, you know, the uh, the main coroner's office in Worthing, and he, and I have the call, says, because we ask him, do you think it's suicide? And he categorically states that they cannot say at this stage no. and that they do not have any idea at this point what actually no. happened. No. Um, and categorically state that. Obviously then we know that his body is um, then gone to post-mortem yeah. and for the pathology um, now... And the cause of death was told to us as death by drowning. And not at, so you're jumping a little bit yeah. because um, these can take, so they can take and we always get Pull in the COVID card. Mm. Well, it normally takes a couple of weeks, yes. but as it's been COVID, it's kind of taking up to six weeks sometimes. So we're still no knowledge of cause of death. Absolutely not. Or circumstances, or what circumstances was going on. Or anything. All we know is the boat, the body on the beach, and that's it. We don't know if there's any witnesses. We know nothing. Nothing. Nada. <laughs> we know nothing. And so the coroner's office say, until the post-mortem's back, we can't say anything because at the moment we don't know cause of death. So we're sitting there waiting, waiting for the surgery appointment with the MP. And we then hear, I don't know how we hear, that a funeral is being arranged. That's right, I can tell you how we hear because my friend... Uh, a mutual friend of mine and Tim hit me up and said that she had asked about attending the funeral and what was going on and uh, that my sister had told her that uh, nobody is, she wasn't invited to the funeral uh, and nor was I and that I was estranged from the family and that's why I didn't know about the any of the arrangements. <clears throat> So you then try to call? Tried to call and ask them why this was going on. <clears throat> um, actually, no, that's not what happened. She phoned me for the oh, second time. She, for the second time in her life. So the first time she ever phoned me was on the 27th of April 2020 when it all kicked off. The second call, she's, the second time she's ever phoned me in her entire life. It's always had to be the other way around. And she phoned and she said, hello, and I'm like, you, I've got, we've got the phone call recorded and you can hear the, my voice. I'm like, hello, mum, what's going on? I'm straight away, like, panicking, not knowing, so I have no information, scared. You can hear the fear. And she just says, now listen, I'm going to pass the phone over to Mark and we've just had a chat and everything that he says to you is what's happening, OK? And passes the phone over to my brother Mark. Who proceeds to tell you you're not going? Who proceeds to tell me that the way he does it is like this. He says, uh, so the funeral's going to be at Ian Hart Funeral Services. I'm like, okay. And he's like, on this road? I'm like, yeah, okay. And, but you can go to the, the, the chapel the day before, up until the day before, and spend time with the coffin on your own. I, I go, what? And he says, that's, that's, that's what's happening. That's what mum wants. And you say, what about Tim? And I say, yeah, what about Tim's wishes? What about, <coughs> what about my wishes? What about Tim's wishes? And he says, well, Tim's wishes are the same. Now, anyone who, uh, who knows me and my brother will know that he spent <laughs> a large portion of his life 
whole time I've been in existence, <laughs> looking after me and protecting me. And uh, little Timmy, aren't you? That's the last thing he ever would have wanted was me being excluded. <clears throat> Absolutely last thing ever. And you know that. And we know that. And everyone knows that. That funeral wasn't what... Wasn't, wasn't anything about what Tim. And unfortunately, when I'm having to witness this and my husband being... And I know people don't know us. You know, not everyone knows us. You know, we're just a couple of people, couple of people. Sitting, on, sitting in our living room. On YouTube, probably. Having a chat on our <laughs> podcast. But I've known many men in my life. <laughs> many DJs. I've looked after hundreds of DJs. I've been their page three model. I started in reinsurance broking for uh, in completely male-dominated industries. I've been in three different male-dominated industries, and I mean male-dominated in every way. I have, I, I have always hung about with the boys for whatever reason, always since I was younger. And you are such the most loving, caring, gentle, beautiful man I have ever met. And that's why I was really bloody glad when you asked me to marry you. <laughs> and that's why I didn't hesitate when I said yes. Right? So when I watch this loving, caring, gentle protective, proper man, and all I'm having to hear this abused, it is enough to... Yeah. It's enough to... Well, um, when when I say... Bring out all of my rock viola. Yeah. <laughs> when I say to my brother, Mark, what? why am I not allowed to come to the funeral? He says, well, if you don't know, what does that mean? And uh... so anyway, I did keep my rock pilot <coughs> in mm. because obviously we're in a situation that isn't, you know, it, it's not my place. That's what you're made to feel anyway. <laughs> and so I kept my rock pilot in, <laughs> although I was just, just desperately, desperately, desperately upset with the way I was being were going treated. Down. Mm. Um, and of course, we weren't the only people that weren't being invited to the funeral. No, you know, that's what transcribed after that. So I did get in touch with Ian Hart Funeral Services. They wouldn't disclose information to me. I tried to tell them the people that I thought should be attending. We, you know, we're in COVID at this point as well. So there's a 30 person restriction on, on uh, funerals. Yeah, but they, 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 and Sam Hart was taking the guest list. He was taking the guest list. He gave me, I, I asked, I said, I wanted. <gasps> Shit. Gav, 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 don't Who is it? Gav, Gav, don't get it. I mean, I, it might be Amazon. No, it's probably it's Amazon, it's right. I need to check. <laughs> <You're my list>. <laughs> <laughs> Knock the door down next time. It was a hefty Amazon knock. No, the Amazon knock aren't normally quite that hefty. Talk about like shit myself or what? <laughs> anyway, so right, so we're not the only. Cut back in. That was Amazon at the door, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> so. Um, so when, yeah, we're not the only people. So obviously when you don't have a relationship with somebody, then you're not going to know who to invite. He had no idea. Yeah. and I Other than like the closest people in the, in the community um, that had known my brother many years ago, they had no idea mm. because they haven't been in his life for the last 30 years. They just didn't know the people. No. Um, whereas... Me and my brother travelled the world together and then when we were in the UK we were working together in the same company so uh, we have a lot of the same acquaintances and, and friends and, life and lifelong friends. And, what, and those companies were? What were you both doing? Panorama Holidays first, repping in Andorra. Yeah. Um, and then 
I was in New York as a DJ, he was, he was repping. And then when we came back to the UK, uh, Child First Limited, working as residential social workers was our first work uh, in, in children's homes. And then later for a company called Asphalaya um, that looks after unaccompanied asylum seekers and did um, educational programs for uh, English young people that were not in education, employment or training. And some of these people obviously are You've got, well, you know. Super close relationships super close with. Relationships. Um, and, you know, my brother had so many super close relationships, especially with the asylum seeking young people because they'd come to this country and been separated from their families. So he literally was a surrogate father to many, many people. Key worker, house parent. Key worker, house parent. Lots of things, I know. Yeah. Lots of things to lots of people. So other brothers. Foster Brothers. So Ross, obviously, it was in the first podcast. He was also not invited. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And, so, you know, there's lots of other family members as well. He'd reconnected with my dad's side of the family just from since 2013. We'd got a lot closer. Um, and, you know, all these Facebook posts and things went on before any other family members were, were notified. Yeah. And so to make this clear... Let alone invited to the funeral. So <coughs> to make it clear, obviously, people are asking Mike and you know other other friends and everything um now there was the 30 restrictions at the time but this wasn't a reason um we do know that there wasn't 30 people in there on the day no. um and that obviously every, people a lot of people were doing things online privately mm. often but yeah. still privately online um, um and that was also refused yeah i said that i you know there's lots of people around the world that love my brother from as far away as Australia uh, that we'd really wanted to have been at the ceremony. And actually, we showed that in the online ceremony that we did after we were refused entry to the uh, funeral that was held. So that's the long and short of it. Um, as, a, as a brother, um, there was no way that anybody was going to stop Mike trying to go to his brother's funeral. Um, and obviously, you, we always come in peace. Yeah. Um, we were aware. That and I told them that. Good, that we, we were aware, and, obviously, that there was a very good chance that they weren't going to let him in. Yeah. But it was very important for you, number one, to... Show up on the day. So to show up on the day and to put this into... Uh, we, we will put this video of the uh, act, what actually happened when we turned up on the day. So the truest sense of it is this, and I like, I like the, the, the detail. So we were one of the first people in the car park at, so it was being just held in the chapel, it wasn't being held at the crematorium, um, it was just being held in the chapel, and we were one of the first people to turn up at, at, in the car park. Um, and we came with your best friend, Si, um, one of your other best friends, Mario, and another best friend, Elia, uh, long-term friends, and all from the local area, and Ross, of course. So, so we were there together, and most importantly, Mike, all of these, any, anybody that was walking into that funeral knows you, every single one. Mm. And I didn't ever quantify at this time, I really never really quantified, because can I, if I was to say I only ever had eyes for you, I didn't ever look at you and go, oh, you look like Tim. Mm. <laughs> because... I met you as you and didn't know Tim, didn't know any of the family or anything like that. Whereas I know a lot of people around here, the first time they clap eyes on mm. you, go, you look yeah. like Tim. So just before we get to that bit, the mourners coming up and we're stood outside. Um, <clears throat> we were, like you say, the first people to arrive in the car park. We saw the other people arrive. We watched them go in. We waited for everybody else to go in and then we tried to enter ourselves peacefully. And we walked through the doors and walked into a room and I saw a couple of people standing this side and I saw my brother Mark standing on the left. And he just looked at the lady that was stood at the door and went, no. She then asked us to leave and I immediately said... I, I, did, I, wasn't, I didn't <coughs> get in, I was still out the door. I was never in the property. Simon was stood behind me, Mario was right there. Uh, and they asked us to leave and I said, OK, I'm not going to cause any problems. I just wanted to try and attend my brother's funeral. Uh, and we walked outside and I burst into tears. Yeah, so you can see all of this on the video, um, and then your brother's oldest 
longest term friend. Steve Weiss. Who also hadn't been invited, but we had put him, I put on, him the on the guest list. And told him where it was and when it was happening and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, he walked up to you, saw us both crying, and uh, said, what's going on? You said, they won't let me in, Steve. Yeah. And, and Stephen was just... In pieces. And he was the last person to, to arrive. Uh, they then shut the doors, and we had made a pact that what we would do was we would stand outside knowing that we had come for, for Tim mm. and that we would do it. And the next thing we knew... We said we would stand outside and greet the mourners, and then once we'd greeted the mourners, that we would leave. <clears throat> and we did, we stood outside and as Sasha was saying, people were turning up and instantly breaking down in tears because they saw Tim. Steve gave me the hug. That was, and to, to, I noticed to stop you put from an outside perspective of saying, I'm at a funeral, I don't know any of these people, no. I'm, not, I'm outside a funeral and I don't know any of these people pretty much turning up. No. Um, but they all know you, so it's a really weird feeling for me in the first place because... Mm. Obviously, you know, and so I can see in these people's eyes what is happening when they clap eyes on you. Yeah. Because you're broken. And these are these are people from deep in my brother's past and our part in our past, our family past, and uh, and the only reason the family would give me about not being able to attend was the the way I treated my brother in the last six months before he died, and I remember saying to him. I mean, not that I did anything, because actually I was prevented from speaking to him. But I said to him, even if I'd done something really bad in the last six months, that doesn't matter. We had a lifetime together. And they were just like, it doesn't matter. But it does. And that's why we're here today still. Life. And that's why we're doing everything that we're doing. Life always matters, and a life, and <clears throat> a person's life, and everything that Our love matters. matters. Love matters matters love carries on love lives so sadly what happens is before we e could even blink an eye two police cars turned up flashing now, lights the whole lot i can categorically hand on heart hope to die in every way there was not one evidence of anybody being even slightly aggressive in any any way, way. whatsoever there was no trying to force in, no shouting, no nothing. nothing. There was just tears and sadness and, and shock. And shock, and I can't believe this happening. So then, when two police cars turn up, it's like, oh my God. You know, not only did my brother not deserve to have a send off so pitiful as where it was, and it was a cheap coffin, the whole lot, not, not all the people there, to then phone the police. We now know it wasn't the first time they called the police on us. No. We were totally unaware at this point, though. We were totally but unaware. But we later find out from police disclosure that these people were reporting us for harassment since May 2020. So, to put that in perspective... No, Tim, they weren't reporting us for that. From they June, were... sorry, July. <clears throat> so, f from... No, it's... It, the first report... So sorry, i rephrase that. The lies in, in the correspondence lies, go back to May 2020. The lies in correspondence go back. The first, the first report. report against us was the day before the funeral. Yeah. And we now know that from the police disclosure that we have had. And we were reported the day before, the day of, and the day after. So we were reported for harassment of your elderly mother on the day before his brother's funeral when you know nothing about what's happened to your brother and, you and she won't to speak to me. And she won't speak to you. And all I'm doing is phoning up asking questions. There's you no level. Been near the house, no haven't harassment. Done, haven't been near the house, haven't called her, haven't done anything. Haven't kicked off. Haven't kicked off. Just cried a lot. <clears throat> so, actually, the two police officers that did attend were actually very nice. They were all right, yeah. And they were all right, as police go. And um, they were very understanding. They hadn't been told that it was a brother trying to enter. They'd just been no. told that we were people. And we were being aggressive. Trying to enter, that we were being aggressive, or family members and people. Um, and, um, yeah, and they were, they were very, 
very all right and I just explained to them and you explained to I explained to one you explained to the other um, what was going on yeah and, they and let us greet the last of the mourners in and then and, we left and then we left all very peacefully and that was the end of that day um, for us in apart from you going back to your mate's house and having a few drinks to drown your actual yeah. sorrow. Well, no, and, and I did read out what I and would have did. read, what I would yeah. have read out if I were permitted to be in that building. And I shared that moment with the people that have loved and supported me. <clears throat> the eulogy, yeah. Yeah. It was a beautiful moment. And I'm glad we didn't get in. And in the way the universe. Yeah, God. Now, I said, I said outside, and I don't care what anybody else says, I said outside, Tim is with us. And on a spiritual level, from the Sunday after he died, I felt his presence flying in to my conservatory, and nothing like this has ever happened to me in my life before. I promise you that. I've never been aware of anything like this. And it was a deep and spiritual moment. And you'd obviously had deep and spiritual moments with your deceased father. And with Tim coming through that day, that he died before we knew anything, but he'd already, you know, he'd already come to you. You'd already embraced, you'd already hugged, you'd already come back together. And for me, I know that that day was the biggest wake-up call that yeah. we have ever, 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 ever hit. I even, even though they were being so horrible in between in passing and us arriving at the funeral, I didn't think that they would would actually turn me away. I didn't think that would happen, and and, and when they did, a lot of thinking. <clears throat> and it was I can well I can describe it as this was the great reveal in those three weeks. Yeah. Um, and the great reveal has just never really stopped for us ever since. No. <laughs> um, it's been the most revealing thing, but for you, on an emotional level, on, on every level, to have to deal with all of this at the same time, okay. and I do now un understand it as, that when your brother passed, and on that day, that you were both enlightened in the most spiritual soul connected way and if everything i spiritually believe um is true that on that day all of the confusion and all of the pain and everything he was released from and the truth they have there is the saying after death comes truth. Mm. It's only a saying I've learned since then. <laughs> but the truth of the reality of really what was happening of both of your life, of everything that was going on, was the wake-up call started in the most graphic, shocking way that day, mm. and it has never stopped. Revealing. It was like you know the guy. I don't know if you know the game Kaplunk, <laughs> and you you pull one thing out and the whole thing goes. <laughs> We're back in. So I think the uh, burning love energy just came in and mm. overheated the camera. <laughs> pew, pew, gave us a little breather. Um, so yeah, It's intense, talking it about is, this stuff. It is, and it's a deep and spiritual thing that had never happened to me before. And I know that you and your brother's love lives on yeah. eternally. And ever since he died, it's only got stronger. It has. Only got stronger. So... At this point, we are believing, so we're now at the 20th of November 2020, so this is three weeks after he died, and... We've had no information. We've had no information. From the police we or don't coroner. know what's going on with the police. We're expecting an in investigation and the normal things that should have happened. So, normal things that should have happened, we now know are... Uh, his room should have been searched. Yeah. All of it, you know, everything. The last person to see him alive should have been interviewed straight away, spoken to straight away. Immediate family members should have been spoken to. Anything, all of these things should have happened. We none of it. We now know that none of those things did happen. None of it. And at this stage, it's the twentieth. The only thing that had happened. He's just been cremated. The only thing that had happened before that, at that point, there was one statement. No, sorry, two statements on the fourth of November from Mark and Joanne. 
But we didn't know about them. But we them. didn't know about them at this point. So we didn't but know. But that's all the, the police investigation had done. And we all, I, I don't know if... At that did point. We, we did know that there was two witnesses on the beach at that point. No, we don't find that out until January. Don't find that out until the January. call after Christmas. Because he asked about my statement and he chases me up about the statement. There you have it. <coughs> so, we know no, we know no information at this stage. And when somebody has died and there's been no medical reason given. And at the moment, at this stage, we're being told that the post-mortem results are still not back. Now... Not to put a um, harsh side of things, but we now, a reality. we now understand that your brother's body had been cremated before any cause of death was given yeah. to and any family member. member, including next of kin, including everybody. So the actual um, post-mortem came back the week after, and we, you were given it, and we have the call from the coroner's office. Mm -hmm. and, and they sent me a copy. And they sent you a copy, and cause of death was... Drowning. Given as drowning. And there was no drugs, and no, and so there was no medication. The toxicology report all came back to zero. There was no... No trace of drugs or alcohol, No, tr a very small trace of the medication he was on for his depression. Historic Historic, historic alanzapine use. So there is nothing, so there's, not there's no alcohol, there's no illegal drugs, and there's no legal drugs. <laughs> there's no medicine, he's straight, As a stone, dog. cold, sober. sober. And that's as much as we know at that point. And that's as much as we know at that point. So we're then still expecting somebody, the police going to phone Mike, somebody's going to call. And then we have surgery with uh, MP Andrew Griffith, Griffith. And he was very helpful. And he very kindly... Well, offers, he to letter, offers, know, to, offers to write a letter. Offers to write a letter to the know. Chief of Sussex Police to ask well, why we're not being given any information that he'd held a sur surgery with us and that we seemed very calm and polite and compassionate. And, and said that even though we did accept that it could be suicide, we until would. an investigation had happened, we could not be sure yeah. of these things mm. and that we needed to be spoken to. So at that point, so that was sent out, that was dated on the 27th of November. Yeah. Um, a couple of days later... Um, you get the phone call. Oh, no, it wasn't a couple of days later. So I know that Joe Shiner, the Chief Constable of Sussex Police, the, uh, Andrew Griffiths wrote us a letter and wrote Joe Shiner a letter. That letter has gone out to her, and it, I believe it was a couple of weeks later. So I believe we're in... It no, was. No, it was a couple of days later. I've got my chronolo chronology. It was a couple of days later. So I then get a phone call because... And the reason that I got the phone call to my phone and not to Mike's phone is because I made the complaint. So this complaint is now what is being followed up by Detective Inspector Leadbeater. 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 And he contacts me regarding my complaint and the letter to Joe Shiner, and that's why he's contacting us. And so I say to him, well, it's my husband that you need to be talking to. It's, it's his, his brother. brother. And he says, what, Mike? So this is the first time I have any police contact after the knock on the door from Sussex Police. And... Uh, Detective Inspector Leadbeater says to me uh, that he's phoning up to uh, ask me to give a statement. And I'm like, great. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. And he says, uh, I just want to know about what happened on the day that your brother took his life. 
Before any investigation has started? This is before any investigation has started. We've only been told that he's drowned. We've had no information. I went in my room and just broke down a bit, didn't I? I had to put you back on the phone for a bit because I was in so much shock that those words had come out of his mouth. Now, what we should mention, and we should mention this at this stage, is at, within this period, within those first couple of weeks, it was told to Mark, first of all, in the very first conversation that she had with him, which was four days, five days afterwards, six days, something like that, wasn't it? Mm, that's right. That a note had been found now. Yeah, that's right. When I was asking what happened, she said, well, we found a note now. And this is when I, sorry, this was when I questioned. I said, why has Mark posted what he's pasted, posted on Facebook? That's why she did, when she told me that. Yeah, and it's an important point. I'm, I'm going to my mum, why is Mark saying on Facebook that Tim's killed himself? What's going on? And she said, well, we found a note now. So we now know that there is a alleged suicide note. And so Mike asks the coroner for a copy. And first of all, the coroner says that he hasn't got a copy and has, I haven't got any knowledge of it. So at this point, obviously, Mike's trying to find out what... What's what this going? note's about. Um, and he questioned his sister and his brother, and they both said that it wasn't addressed to him and he wouldn't be seeing it ever. So, so they wouldn't tell me what was written in it, uh, so that I didn't have any right to know what was written in it and I wouldn't get to see it at inquest. At which point I did step into the conversation and say that a European Convention of Human Rights is an interested person. So anybody who is a close fa or a family member of somebody that has died suddenly, you have the right to be an interested person at their inquest. It doesn't matter who in the family says that you have no rights or to tells you to fuck off, go mm. away, and mm. nobody's talking about that mm. dead person. Mm. Uh, do not ever, and always know your human rights, do not ever let anybody tell you you've got no right because you have every right as the next man. It doesn't matter whether you're from a rich family, poor family, you've just got off the boat, it doesn't matter. You have rights in this country. And that is really, really, really important for everybody to realise. Yeah. Because when people try and take away your rights, they take, take them away in all kinds of different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. And you need to know your rights, because if you don't, you will, in this society, you can be walked all over. Yeah, if you've got anyone that's uh, got legal experience and will give you advice, get advice. If you can afford legal help, get the legal help straight away. Yeah, and this is one of the things that the next of kin in this circumstance would have been able to get legal help, but they refused it. They turned it down. It. So we trying to get legal help, and everybody knows how expensive legal help is. Um, and, you know, we'll go on to what happened to that in the next podcast. Yeah. But at this stage, we are being told that, no, by the family, that you're not going to see the note. And the coroner's saying that at this stage, they're holding on to it and cannot share it with you. Yeah. So first of all, they say they haven't got it. Then they say they have got it, but they can't share it with you at this moment. Mm -hmm. Now, we now know that the other parties were saying that Mike was not allowed to have any information not yeah. allowed to know anything. So the same thing that they're saying on the phone, they're saying to the coroner, not allowed, we don't need to have anything, it's all his fault, it's all my fault, it's all our fault. It's all our fault. <laughs> Everything that's happened in the whole family is all down to me walking in and all of this. Kind and of me thing. being born. And you being born. How dare you? How dare I? How fucking dare you? We could have moved to Australia. <laughs> and that's what. And they that's an actual f and that's thing. An actual fact. When Mike was born, he was told that if it wasn't for him, they would have moved been to living in Australia. Anyway, the note, obviously, in these kind of scenario, in any this, the whole everything was hung on this note. Can I just say we we did end up getting sent a copy of the note before the inquest. And, and as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't written by my brother. As soon as I saw it, I knew, one, it wasn't his handwriting. Number two, it's not what he would have said. And a category of it's other reasons. Yeah. There's loads of things. But before L we go on reasons. to that, we will go on to that in the next podcast. So, so yeah, that that is... <laughs> 
unfortunately, that's being withheld and everything's being withheld from you at this stage. Yeah. But we do know that at least one thing that we have managed to do is open an investigation to find out what happened to Timothy Wall on the 30th of October 2020 and why his body was seen in the water that day. But the first witness said that he was alive and trying to get to shore. And the second witness had That's a right. different story. After and I'm not trying to leave anybody on tenterhooks. No, we don't, get, we don't get that information until January. So I have the conversation with Leadbeater in December, just before yeah. Christmas, and he says what he says. Um, he come, I come back on the phone and he backtracks a lot. And he says, oh, I'm not making any assumptions yet uh, and I need a statement from you. Obviously, it's just before Christmas. I'm in shock. I, I said to him, you know, I'll, I'll give it to him in, in, in January and give me some time to, to do it. Um, and then he follows up to find out where the statement is in January. <coughs> um, and uh, I said, it's, I'm saying it's almost ready. Um, and I, ask, I start trying to ask him, you know, what investigation have you been doing? And the only thing he can tell me is he says, well, we've made a number of inquiries. Uh, I've checked CCTV uh, and devices. Uh, and as far as I can see from my inquiries, there are no suspicious circumstances. And that's all you'd tell him? And that's all they would tell me. He said, I can't tell you anything else because we're, we're here, to, not to. we've been told only to deal with the next of kin and we're not allowed to share any of that information with you. Now, all we know is at this stage that the investigation had been opened and the investigation did remain open, but we do know that practically no investigating was done by Sussex Police. It was being done. We, we managed to get the full police disclosure for the day that my brother passed, just a few days after the last, we recorded the last podcast. A few days after. So there has been constant revelations and every day, every week, every, every throughout the last two and, two and a half years yeah years. new information would come to light it's it's yeah it, and, it, and this is why these podcasts it's been a slow reveal yeah and in some ways thank god it has because mm. sometimes getting too much information can just overload you yeah but no no information should have ever been withheld and nobody should ever not be talking to mike and and that whole breakdown of communication is how abuse works. Yeah. Isolation, uh, blame, wrong communication, shame. blame, shame, unnatural, suspicious things Behaviour. going on, and everybody trying to cover mm -hmm. their asses. Mm -hmm. And that is basically, in a nutshell, an awful lot of what has been going on. And I'm not here to, and both of us are here, not here, we, we went into this going to Sussex Police. For help. Help. Tim rang them asking Tim for help. Tim rang 999 first. Right? I, we always went in good faith, with trust, and really 100% believing that the police would help, would look at things properly, and would not... Would do a thorough investigation. Would do a thorough investigation, and would not just... Nothing to see here. Yeah. And so we, we, it's not we just like, couldn't work it out. It's not like we have some axe to grind with Sussex Police or with Sussex NHS or with anybody. We never had. There's nothing like that. It is, at the end of the day, everybody, and this was what I was saying about the rights, everybody has the right. You can't say that that person has the right more than and that person. And you don't, person, yeah. They that can't. The They're not supposed to treat Nobody you like that. You can just treat you. It doesn't matter what somebody says about you or mm. somebody's made up about you, all of that. Everybody should always be dealt with equally. And that is the law. Yeah. And it is equal human rights that we have. And, and we weren't from that point onwards. From, from the moment that Tim passed, we were treated unequally by the police and by the coroner's office due to the extreme level of lie and deceit and manipulation. and manipulation by my mother. The woman who's lost one son and her youngest son is broken in pieces. Yeah. 
we do now have, thank God, a lawyer who is helping us and Oliver Alfala um, from OJ Law, thank you for, uh, for helping us as we have been crying out, literally crying out for legal help. Yeah. Um, we did do a GoFundMe. Um, we were crying out for legal help from the start. Um, but every time all of this, everything that's happened is people have been trying to shut us down, shut us down, shut us down. And, and we've had to deal with all of this for the last two and a half years without any legal support. And this woman here has had to do pretty much all of the admin because I'm a fucking DJ. Um, and and as, well as, really as, well as, as well as take on all the emotional stuff. But yeah, we have, th that's where we're going to end today's podcast by letting you know the good news that we do have support now, criminal lawyer. And uh, there's a lot more to dive into and get much deeper into this. Um, but we'll get into that in the next episode. Yeah, and that we always never be afraid to say your truth. Never be afraid to stand up for your rights. Yeah. Uh, never let anybody think that you're less a human being than anybody else. No. Uh, we're all beautiful human beings. And whatever it is you've got to say, just give it a go. Like today, we didn't know how far we were going to get in this podcast. We've got as far as we've got, and that's all right. And that's okay. And all, all we can ever do in our communities and everything is love and support and take care of each other. And if we, if we turn a blind eye to um, abuse, to things going on in our community and we don't stand up, then we watch our communities break yeah. and our families break and society break. And none of us want that. No. None uh, of us want And that, that is why, just quickly, to get this in, because on the 1st of July, we are going to be holding a ceremony and celebration of my brother's life at Carrots Cafe on Southwick Beach, which is where me and he first raved together uh, back in the early 90s. I'd sneak, snuck out my uh, bedroom window to go and rave. And... Uh, so long story short, turn around on the beach. My brother looks at me and goes, Oi, what are you doing here? Um, and that's where we're going to have this party. And there's lots of people coming together. And this is open to everybody and anybody uh, locally that know us or wherever you're from that know and us. It's, it's not just about people online. that know Tim. Yeah, it's going to be streamed online. And we're going to uh, give him the send off that he truly deserved. And a celebration of life is something that a lot of people do. Yes. You know, and it, it is that what's what it's all about because you know ceremony celebration. It is such. We don't thing. forget. We don't, and this is what um, Sonia and Lucinda, the therapist, were saying in the Rise Show this morning, and just for me to finish there, but we're saying I have actually got to know your brother far mm. better since his death than I did in life. Because I'm don't know, I'm not as you know, I only came along recently. <laughs> You're new to the story. And this is often happens is when you actually go back and go, oh, you know, who this person was and we all should be we are able to find out and mm -hmm. celebrate what they did in this life. And and that's, and that's what, what we're gonna do. And that's what we all want. So yeah, we invite everybody to join us. And um Thank you. Until the next podcast. Thanks for joining us on uh, this episode and we hope you come back for the next. We love you all.